Hi all and welcome into Berno, where today we are making a traditional Chinese beef stock. Which, historically speaking, is a bit odd. As throughout a lot of China's history, beef was forbidden. The central government did not want peasants killing working animals like oxen or horses. Although this law wasn't always enforced. It does show there was a strong social stigma against the wastefulness of eating beef. In 1882, the American missionary John Livingston Nevius wrote, Beef is never exposed for sale in a Chinese market. There is a strong universal prejudice against eating beef. There was one community in which this stigma did not exist though. The Chinese Muslims. As we know, Chinese cuisine is quite keen on pork. But we also know that practicing Muslims and Jews are banned from eating the flesh of the swine. So. Chinese Muslims in southern China compensated this with more poultry and mutton. Whereas in the north, where most Chinese Muslims lived and live to this day, beef Moo. was more popular. Very popular, actually. So popular as to the point where the area around Beijing's oldest mosque became known as Cow Street. You have to really like something a lot to get your street named after it. Oh. The bulk of Chinese Muslim population, today and in the 18th century, could be found here. So it's not as if they could go fishing. The recipe we are going to make in part 2 of this episode is what most people agree is the starting point for Lanjo Lamian in 1799. However, there's a problem. This recipe comes from a tradition where it would be passed down orally from generation to generation. For a very long time, we therefore assumed that this recipe would be lost to time. That wouldn't be extraordinary though. It's quite common for recipes and techniques from this period of Chinese history to simply be declared gone once a cook or shopkeeper has passed away. Not much has changed there if we're honest. So we had already cobbled together our own recipe using period appropriate ingredients like cumin, cassia and ginger. But then we found this. Yeah, we couldn't read it either. But we got somebody who can read Chinese better than Google Translate to summarize it for us. According to this website, a descendant of Chen Wei Jing, who is widely agreed to be the progenitor of modern Lanzhou Lamian, spilled the proverbial beans in a speech. The recipe was apparently passed down as a poem, because of course it was. So what went into this secretive broth? First up, beef shin. Between 1.5 and, and 2 kilo. This is a pretty cheap cut, but also very hard. Pretty much only usable to grind into mince or boil to destruction. Which is exactly what we are going to do. Next up we need beef bones. Unlike with French fond, we're not looking for this to congeal. So just a few will do. We got marrow bones here, but they don't need to be necessarily. Now for the aromatics. Lanjo beef stock recipes found in cookbooks these days usually have 6 to 10 aromatics. This one has over 20. So we are going to need a nice big container for these. We're going to mention all the ingredients mentioned in the poem, but we won't be adding all of them in, as some of them are going to be difficult to come by. First up is the fruit of the cassia tree, also called the cassia fistula. You can still get that these days, but it's pretty hard and expensive to get, so we are simply going to use some cassia bark. It is sold in most supermarkets under the name sweet cinnamon. Cardamom, easy enough to get. Next up is acuranthus root. We searched long and hard for it, but we were not able to find this. Next up is the root of a plant called Orglandia lapidecni, which we were able to find in a traditional Chinese apothecary. The next aromatic is known as female ginseng. You should be able to find this in most Chinese supermarkets. Now we're adding some cloves, bay leaves. A bit trickier than cloves and bay leaves, but not really hard, is long pepper. You can find this in Indian specialty shops or online quite easily. Next up is the Langshang Jia Tsaoko, also known as black cardamom. Again, most Chinese supermarkets will stock this. Then there's an ingredient which the poem calls fragrant. We have no idea what they meant or what this is supposed to be. If you know, let us know in the comments, please. Sand ginger. Then we are adding in shell ginger, which we got from the Chinese apothecary. Next up is the Plantago Asiatica. The traditional pharmacist thought it was very funny that we bought this as it has no discernible scent or flavor. We're also adding a tea called Red Robe. Again, most Chinese specialty shops will have this. We got ours from the apothecary. Then add one star anise. Coriander seeds, easy enough. A big piece of fresh galangal. 
Then there's Remania glutinosa, another ingredient with a strong background in Chinese traditional medicine. So we're adding a bit of that. Next up is something the poem calls Moon Mountain Ginger. We decided that was just ginger. Then some fennel seeds, one whole nutmeg and the dried peel of a tangerine. Again, easy enough to obtain in Chinese supermarkets. And then lastly, there's the Hopea hyanensis. We are not adding this one because, well, exactly. You might have gleaned that a lot of these ingredients come to us from traditional Chinese medicine. The medicinal flavor associated with this is, regardless of any alleged health benefits, quite popular in large parts of Asia. There are entire restaurant chains throughout the Chinese-speaking world that predominantly serve medicinal food. So even though it probably won't cure your eczema, you might just like the aroma. We though are not too keen and are just adding all these ingredients to be true to the original recipe. If you're not interested in being authentic, we would just add these. Put the meat and bones in a stock pot and bring them to a boil, quickly blanching them for about one minute. Then clean them off and refresh your water. Then refill the pot, add in the sack of aromatics, and bring everything up to a boil and then immediately reduce to a simmer. Ladle off any impurities that flow to the top. Since you've already blanched these bones, most of them should be gone. Keep the heat at a very gentle level, bubbles barely breaking the surface. As we said before, unlike its French counterpart, Chinese stock should remain clear. It should look like clear tea. So in order to achieve this, we need to cook it gently so it doesn't get cloudy. Put a lid on it and leave it for two hours. The story of this cut of meat will be continued in part two. Leave the rest to gently simmer further for another hour. At this point, your stock should look like this, nice and clear. After letting it simmer for another hour, we are going to sieve our stock. Remove your aromatics bag and decant your stock into sealable or freezeable containers. Let it now cool down on a rack. Speed is of the essence. Once cooled down, fridge or freeze them. Our stock is supposed to be clear and at the two hour mark, it was. So you might want to stop after two hours. We followed methods that were clearly not designed for 200 year old poems. There is luckily an easy solution if your broth is too dark. A quick three to one dilution with fresh water will get the broth back to its clear state. As it should be, per the rules of Lanjo Lamian, which we will make in part two. We hope you liked this video on poetic stock. If you did, please leave us a like or tell us in the comments. It really helps us out. If you're new, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss our next video where we put this stock to good use. See you in the next one and thank you very much for watching.